Hi guys, I'm Kay Smith and welcome to Outlier, where we share inspiring stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things outside of their comfort zone in a bid to help other outliers and entrepreneurs do the same. In today's episode, we are reviewing Nathan Farby's amazing interview, and we're going to go over the power of focus when it comes to success in your business, life, and in sport. And if you stick around to the end of this episode, we have an awesome gift for you, valued at $495. I'm joined again as well by CEO, our CEO, Andrew McComb. How are you today, Andrew? Very good, Kay. How are you? I'm really, really great. I really enjoyed this episode. It was really insightful and uh, I'm really excited to hear your key takeaways because I know we've got so much to cover. Yeah, good, good, good times. It's such a great interview. We, uh, in fact, we got two interviews. We had so much content we had to create too. So if you've missed the first one, you can click here and you can watch it from here. And if you want to watch, we did a second interview all around his keys for success. So if you want to watch that one too, you can click here and, and have a look at that. But effectively, it's about Nathan Farber. He's a six-time world adventure racing champion, and he's often described as the Lionel Messi of adventure racing. He's a true champion in every sense of the word, and he's achieved more than anyone else in the history of the sport. But growing up in Nelson, New Zealand, life could have been so different for this outlier. Nathan's wayward teenage years could have seen him take an entirely different course, but it was his passion for adventure, the outdoors, and his trusty mountain bike that allowed him to chart his own path and ultimately set himself and his family up for life all whilst passing on his knowledge and passion to the next generation of adventure outliers. It's a story of courage, determination, and overcoming insurmountable odds in his personal, family, and sporting life. Now, Kay, normally what we do is we have three key points or learnings that we get from each lesson, but honestly, there was, I think from my notes, I have 13 different lessons. Uh, so it's gonna be a little bit different to normal. And um, yeah, hopefully get a whole, or translate a whole heap of value from Nathan's uh, episode to uh, to the viewers. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to go through all these points because they're just so valuable when it comes, as we said in the intro, to business and to life and to sport or to any passion or hobby that you've got. Like everything that Nathan talks about, you can really apply to anything you're doing in your life. Absolutely. And I guess, like, as I mentioned, the, the, the key points or key learnings are not in any particular order. So let me start with the first one. It's, uh, I, I guess for the viewers who don't know about adventure racing, it's essentially a five to six day race where really they have maybe four hours sleep a day if they're lucky. And some races go for about a thousand kilometers. So it's pretty intense. So one of the first learnings I got there is, oh, and the other thing is you, it's a team of four people and you have to have at least one female. So what's really important, obviously, before that you even start, and this applies to business in general, is making sure that you know what the dynamics of your team needs to be. So a big thing for Nathan and his team, he's the captain of the New Zealand team, um, is to obviously get the right people. And one thing that really stood out for me, though, is obviously a 1,000 kilometres, you're going to hope they're going to have the physical attributes. But... For Nathan, that wasn't a huge, he obviously was, it was important to him to make sure that people could finish the race. But his biggest attribute that he looks for in a team member is actually that they are people that he'd like to hang out with if he was in their town and obviously wanted to go and have a coffee with them or something. So it sounds quite a simple concept, but he basically said that 90% of teams don't finish an adventure race. And the reason for that primarily as they implode the team dynamics break down they start fighting with each other and they pull out of the race or obviously it leads to injury etc so massive part there as he just said he, he wants to get on with them and he treats them like family he knows them so well he, you know we treat them like family but he also said another key point was they have to have mental and emotional resilience because obviously you know if you're not sleeping and you're 20 hours a day high intensity exercise for five six days in a row it's going to start to screw with the old mind a bit so you've got to be very uh let's say level balanced upstairs to uh to, to form a successful team so i found that really interesting it, it, there wasn't a huge emphasis on the physical that's interesting so it's almost like literally it's teammates 
they need to be also be your mates and they've got to be people like you said that what you want to hang out with the, and I guess also the met from the mentor attributes it's the kind of people that you know have got your back so when you're when you're in a place where you, you, know, you said after four hours sleep you may be struggling that this person's got your back that this person you know you're, you're going to work together as a solid team as well yeah I think the key like you know kind of alludes to point two is you don't want someone who's getting stressed out and then causing grief uh, amongst the team and he does talk about how they do have meltdowns and that but um, they just know as long as the intent's good, and we'll talk about that later, but they're in, as long as their intent's good and they come from a good place, they all know that if someone has a meltdown or stressed out, they just need some time or some space to, to get through it. And one thing he talks about, and this is point two, is really about playing the long game. He, he talks about young teams will come in and try to win the race on the first day. And the problem with that, it's a five or six day race. So they blow out. Um, and he, you know, he talks about how they're not one until the fifth or sixth day. So like business, like sport, like family life, like life in general, if you're going to sign up for something like this, it isn't about a, a one trick pony. It's about a long term focus. So obviously, especially for entrepreneurs out there, that's a massive, um, a massive thing you need to be focused on. If you're looking for a win tomorrow, um, it's probably not going to happen. So maybe entrepreneurship's not for you. But uh, obviously having a team that's in alignment with that philosophy too. You don't want someone in your team who's who's just all out for the um, the short-term gratification. It's just not going to work. Yeah, it's true. And there's something that he does mention that, you know, he's made that, and that's one of the points that you're going to come to, that he's made that mistake before where he's gone for the end goal. But actually when he's looking at the, say, like the day one, day two, or whether it's cycling or rafting or it's just being in the moment of where they are in that in that race or in business or whatever and being all in and making sure that part gets done to the best of their ability and then once that's done you then move to the next thing absolutely it's just about staying in the present right which we'll get to that shortly but leads to again point three it's essentially and this applies to obviously in teams and, and as, a, as an individual and we deal with it a lot with outlier is when your emotion is up your intelligence comes down. You start making poor decisions under pressure. So what people typically do in an adventure race and happens in business and that as well is they change the plan. So what actually happens in the adventure race is they get given the maps and they get given the um, direct, I wouldn't say direction, but um, checkpoints, et cetera, prior to the race. So they get some time to sit down and plan their plan on how they're going to attack the whole course. And so what's interesting about that is when they do that, their, their emotions down and they're very calm. So they make really good decisions and they make a really good plan. But when they get out on the race, it has this tendency for, when, especially when you're under pressure, to start changing the plan. And again, I just keep referring to business. It's very easy to do that in business. Uh, intellig uh, emotions up, intelligence goes down. So one thing they've learned to do really well is keep their emotions very level. Um, stick to the plan that they formulated at the start. And it's not saying that they haven't stuck to the plan at all times and they haven't had meltdowns, et cetera. But obviously having the plan gives them a benchmark to be able to go back to when the emotion's up to make sure that they are making intelligent decisions. Mm. And I guess that, again, that goes back to the point one of having knowing your team and knowing, the, knowing that they're the people that are going to be able to handle that and know whether and know where the points are and know the game plan. And I guess also what, was, what I'm getting at is we don't know what goes on before the race or the planning that's involved or the discussion that goes on before beforehand, before they even get to the start line. Well, that's true too. Like, And that leads me to point four is, like he mentioned, they're six-time world champions, but the first 10 years of their career was all about learning from their mistakes. So... They made a lot of mistakes and what came out of that for them was the importance of discipline and trait and trusting the race plan. So they obviously learned in the early days, they were making decisions out on course that were pulling them off the plan and over time realized, you know what, we just got to stick to the plan. So prior to the race, again, the intelligence or the emotions down, so the intelligence is up. That's the best time to trust the plan. Obviously, if you apply that to business, Yes, things change, and obviously with adventure racing, you do need to be adaptable. 
Um, but obviously, the, the thing I love about uh, Nathan's story is it, the whole power of focus is really the analogy of a map. You know, you need to know where you are now and where you're going, and then what are these steps in between, and then you use it as a reference point. But you don't essentially, once you've made your plan on where you're going, you don't veer off in, in massive different directions because something's not going well. You just make minor adjustments and, and corrections in order to stick to the same plan. So as he mentioned, 10 years it took to learn from the mistakes, but in that time, you know, they become more and more confident. And then obviously they're six times world champions. No one's, no one's won more than Team New Zealand. So obviously it pays off, stick to the plan. Right, and yeah, you don't become a world champion overnight. And that's with everything, Olympics or football or anything, you know, it takes years of dedication. Um, I think there's, there's just another point that you're going to come, come to about knowing about what you love to do and being passionate about it. And then once you know yourself, once you know what that is, then you just kind of keep at it and you keep going and then until you become champion at it. Yeah, well, it's another good point, right? It's about long-term gratification. So in order to have a long-term gratification mindset, if something's going to take you 20 years, um, if you're not passionate about it, then what's the point in doing it, right? It's, you're not going to wake up every morning and be excited to do it for very long. So the key he talks about is, He's got a triangle, which I'll get to shortly, but essentially he, he talks about decide what you love doing and then ideally get someone to pay you to do it. So that's like the perfect business, right, for all of us. If we all did what we loved and we worked out a way for the market to pay us for it, you couldn't ask for more than that, right, as, a, as an entrepreneur. But when it, it's kind of a dual-edged sword there is it, when you – that will keep you going for a lot longer, so that helps that long-term gratification thing, right? And keeps you disciplined knowing at least you're enjoying what you're doing. But it's also, it's interesting because, you know, not a lot of people are making a lot of money in that world of venture racing stuff, right? So they've got to work elsewhere. Then they've got to learn or allocate time to train and then maybe make some money. The beautiful thing with Nathan, and he does this with everything he does, is he's turned it into an income. And so he has a triangle, which we'll get to, that talks about you know, a whole model that he applies when it comes to doing anything. And that then leads me to point six. So the point five is all about decide what you love doing and get someone to pay you for it. Point six is about the importance of creativity when trying to turn your passion into your pension. So with Nathan, he will sit down before he does anything and he'll design what success looks like before he starts. So when he decided to get into adventure racing, because before that he was uh, he represented New Zealand for mountain biking, and he was almost also a um, multi-sport athlete, um, very renowned in the coast-to-coast -coast races, etc. He then decided after doing those two sports that he wanted to turn his attention to world adventure racing, right? So or adventure racing, and so he's like, well, if I'm going to be the best at this, what am I going to need? And obviously, money was one of those. So he looked at different income streams that he could have earned through the um, competing. And so for one was prize money, one was having good sponsors. And then off the back of his success, he's also created his own events, the spring challenge, the summer challenge, and also a nutrition company. But before he even did that, he would be like, all he wanted to do was uh, work in the outdoors. So he worked for a rafting company or a kayaking company. And he realized pretty quick, if he was just an employee, that wasn't going to last long for him. So he realized in order to make good money, he had to own the business. But again, it's just him thinking creatively at all times about how we can, you know, you talk about squeeze the maximum amount of juice out of the lemon. And again, it's a process that you want to try to do before you embark on your journey as best as you can. And um, point seven, he also talks about the importance of quality over quantity and getting the most efficiency out of his training and everything that he's doing at all times because adventure racing you know he talks about four to six hours a day training leading up to an event which I'll, he'll do 12 weeks prior he'll that's when he ramps up his training so everything he's doing is also all about quality and getting the most out of himself as well um so just some, some fascinating learnings there k of I think what I took, again, I look at the map and I look at Nathan, I can just see him and his team 
plotting the process before they even take the first step out on the course. Um, so that, that's a massive one for me. And then when you inject the passion into it and then creativity, knowing you're going to win from it in multiple forms from an income perspective, so you can continue to do it on a longer term basis, it's pretty powerful stuff. Yeah, it's, it's such a such an entrepreneurial mindset as well, even though, okay, he's got other businesses, but it really does relate to to this as a as a sport. You know, he's obviously looking from, you know, as we would describe as an entrepreneur mindset because he's, like you say, he's looking at putting his plan together, he's mapping it out, he's looking at multiple streams of income. He's then like, if you've got a launch, let's say somebody's got a launch period, they're launching a product, they're launching a new um, online program, a coaching program, whatever that is, there's usually a 12 week intensive uh, launch period that they go through. So in, it's kind of as you're talking, it sounds like you know, ath- um, entrepreneurs are almost athletes and, and in their own right as well, because you have to go through the same stages to get your product or your business out there. Yeah, well, he talks about that. So uh, a lot of athletes, when they transition to the business world, are very good because they already know, you know, their process. They'll apply the sporting process to the business. And in reverse, he, he was saying that a lot of entrepreneurs are very successful adventure races because they apply that same business planning model into the planning of the race and then the execution of it. One thing that really stood out for me, and we talked to earlier about Nathan's model, is he has a, it's a triangle model that has passions on top. And then on one point down here would be dollars or money. And then the other one is skills. And he talks about how before he does anything, and he encourages anyone to look at this, that you've got to have all of the three components before he will take action on any new business or any sporting endeavor or whatever. And effectively, it works like this. So you have to be passionate about it because if you're not, it's not going to last like we talked about. It's not going to get you out of bed every morning. And it's certainly not going to help you when times get tough if you don't have the passion, but he's also big on it also has to make money because if you're not receiving something from it, it's going to be hard to stick at it, no matter how passionate you are, you know, especially if you've got a family to support, et cetera. And then the third uh, element is you've obviously obviously got to be skilled at it and have the, the talent or the abilities. And so he looks at that triangle before he does everything and he goes, well, am I passionate about it? Yes. Am I skilled at it? Yes. Is it going to make money? Uh, probably not. So he will actually can it right then and there, which I know is pretty hard for entrepreneurs if you're passionate about something. Um, but he literally goes, well, that's a real good gauge for me not to waste my time, money and effort uh, committing to that process. Because you don't want to get five years down the track and go, well, I knew this back at the start. So again, we look at the map, right? And go, ah, oh, geez, it's actually the wrong direction. The other option is obviously if you're passionate about something and it makes money, but you're not talented at it talks about well go and upskill yourself and that's probably the easiest thing to do out of all of them uh, and then the other one is obviously if it makes money and you're good at it but if you're not passionate about it what's the point because ultimately you're not it's not going to last anyway it'd be boring uh not, not after not much time so that's a really powerful uh triangle that i think all entrepreneurs out there could look at before they start anything i know for me personally many times i've started businesses that i'm just super passionate about talented at but some of them just don't make money, right? They just, you know, it's not what people want. It's not, it's not about me. It's about the market. And if they don't want it, and sometimes that can be really tough, you know, that you're so passionate about something and no one wants it, it, it can be pretty um, disheartening. So um, I talked to him about it. I said, well, you know, could you stick it out at times, blah, blah, blah. And he's just like, nah, it's just not worth it. it after time, it's just not worth it. But it is very hard for someone who is passionate to, to, uh, to give that up. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one in itself. And again, that leads me to point nine, which is just, again, the power of passion. And he says, if you, if it, if it, if you didn't want to work, what would you do, right? And we talk about that. If you've got all the time and money in the world, what would you do? And he, his theory is, well, if you didn't have to work, what would you do every day? What would, when you wake up, what would you do? So the power of passion is it gives you energy. But it also gets you through the hard times. And I know we've talked about this every episode, but it's a fundamental for me, passion, because if you're not passionate about what, what's the point? Uh, but so many entrepreneurs out there just do things because they make money or because they're good at it or because someone came to them with uh, a requirement. But to me, I just, I don't know, I just think for outliers, 
if you talk to all of the outliers, which we have, every one of them talks about the power of passion. So yeah, make sure your business has that element in it. That's so true. And I think you're right. I think that's really something that comes across in all of the episodes that outliers are passionate about what they do. They, they have the drive, they have the skill, they have the mindset, and they, they really push forward what they're doing. And I think what I also take away from, from what Nathan says, what you're saying, is that if you've got one of those components missing, it also then can lead to burnout. Because if you're not getting the, the, the finances coming in and so you're struggling, if you haven't got the skill and so you're not feeling like you're good enough or you're failing, and if you haven't got the passion and so you're not, you, don't wanna, you haven't got the drive, then every day becomes a slug. It's just going to lead to burnout. It's going to lead to stress. It's going to lead to ill health. So I think that's also a trigger if you haven't looked at this model to kind of say, okay, well, how am I feeling right now? And is this part of this model that's missing? Yeah, another way I look at that, Kay, is like you mentioned, burnout. It's like, are you feeling met for the effort that you're putting out? And that doesn't have to be financially. That, like Nathan has with his triangle, that's like, am I feeling like I'm receiving? And I know adventure races would definitely feel like, even though it's hard work, they're in nature. They're in beautiful environments that, you know, they probably would never go there if they didn't do the that sport. It was like me with golf. I'd never got to have seen some of the incredible environments if I didn't play golf. So what I found with that is I was every day feeling inspired by being in those environments. And sometimes I would happily forego any money knowing I was receiving that because that was priceless to me. You literally couldn't pay for some of those experiences. Or if you did, that'd be, you know, I'd, I'd be paying tens of twenties, thousands of dollars but I was getting paid to do it, which makes it even better. So when you look at business too, I think the key is there's multiple ways of feeling met. And if essentially to feel met, you need to feel like your energy out is being reciprocated with energy in. And obviously passion is a great indicator of that. And so if you're starting to find your passions waning or you weren't passionate in the first place, then I don't think you're going to feel met energetically for very long. Mm, that's a really great reframe uh, and you know, I can I can really understand um, yeah understand that you know the, yeah the point's being met and that, and that thing that still applies to all of it you know if you're feeling met financially if you're feeling met with your skill set because I think if you don't have the skill set you're not meeting yourself as well you're not feeling met in your own ability and then also like financial so I really think yeah that really goes with everything I know something you're going to mention is about then kind of being outside of your comfort zone in that because when you're looking at that model as well, it's like, okay, well, okay, I, I, I can, I'm, I'm meeting all those points in that model, but I think if we're too comfortable, then you're not being met either because then it becomes too easy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that's a good point. Like he talks about, obviously that for six days, they're out of their comfort zone. Um, and for a lot of people, they wouldn't even start adventure racing because they're going to feel like it's, they're going to be out of their comfort zone before they start. But one thing I asked him or talked to him about is that the importance of belief before pursuing anything do you have to believe something or you're capable of something before doing it and he was like well not really because even from his early young days you know he he didn't know what he didn't know but he did it he took action and in the taking action he learned the lessons that then expanded his comfort zone or his reality which then allowed him to now pursue things like 20 years down the track that he deemed you know, most people would deem very dangerous, but to him, they're just totally normal. But if he'd done that from the start, when he, his comfort zone didn't encompass those dangerous things, uh, he would have freaked himself out. But in reverse, if he hadn't taken the action with small steps along the way, again, we go back to the map, you know, set the big goal, but then take the small steps. He never would have stretched his comfort zone, have the ability or capacity that he has now. So again, just a, it's just a beautiful... Uh, adventure racing is an amazing microcosm for life because every uh, six days of 20 hours a day, 120 hours in six days, he, he essentially talks about it being, you know, one year in a week. It's like you're living one year in a week. And so you're learning so much about yourself and your teammates by putting yourself out of your comfort zone. So that was fascinating too. And obviously by doing that, your, your overall ability is expanding so much greater than what you may have believed it to have been before you embarked on that journey. 
Mm. And so what's just something that's coming to my mind now is like, would you, if you've been on that intense intensity where say you've done a whole year and a week or you've been really out of your comfort zone, how would you then from your perspective assimilate that into your being, you know, like um, if that's the right word I'm looking for, then you go through such intensity and you go outside your comfort zone, you learn so much. What would you recommend to then, um, yeah, just assimilate that into your being to then move forward? Because otherwise I think you could be overwhelmed. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I guess, uh, again, Nathan, he talked about a race he did in China and Tibet. It was a thousand kilometer race. It was over six days. And he honestly didn't think anyone would be able to achieve it in that time. But the thing that he learned in that, I think he was saying there's 12 to 15 stages in a race. And rather than thinking about the big picture, e.g. how are we going to get from Tibet to China a thousand kilometers away, literally they folk, the team focuses on one stage at a time. That is the goal. That's like their long-term goal is just the stage. But then one step at a time within that stage, you know? So if it's a mountain bike ride, it might be a, man, one pedal at a time or, you know, one lamppost at a time down the road. If it's a climb, it's going to be, you know, one you know, maybe 10 metres up or whatever. They've got to get to a, a little um, an area or whatever. But what that did is it allowed them to give their best in the present moment. And obviously we've heard about that a lot in many, many different realms of personal development and business is huge. You can only focus on one thing at a time. So when you do focus, focus on the most important thing, which is the thing that's in front of you right now and give it your 100% attention. Mm, it says, and it's those little wins that kind of get you through. Well, exactly. So he talks about that too, right? It's like at the start, he doesn't really think like they can do it, but every time they get to a new stage, they look back and go, oh, wow, we've just achieved that stage. And now we've only got to focus on this stage. And then all of a sudden, if there's 12 to 15 stages, well, they're all of a sudden finished and they got through it, you know? So if he was to focus on the whole thing, it's just going to be too overwhelming. So focus on one stage or one short-term goal at a time and then focus on each step within that goal. And that just, I, they talk about a thing that's called uh, eating the elephant one bite at a time. You know, if you try to eat an elephant all at once, it's pretty uh, pretty overwhelming. Um, so you just eat it one bite at a time. Oh, amazing! And I think that kind of comes to your to your next point about also learning from people who are already doing it as well. You know, we don't have to come. We don't have to turn up and think that we are. We're on our own in, in we're on our own in this and we can't learn from other people but there are already people that have done it been there done that and it's okay to to learn from them too right yeah well, i guess that's what outlier is about right we try and share these um inspiring stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things outside the comfort zone and all we're trying to do is help people fast track their journey so they don't have to do all the trial and error that all the successful people have already done so why not model the top people? And what I love about Nathan is he mentioned it is like literally, even if he meets someone for one hour, he will make sure a big takeaway is that they are the top of their field. So that's really important. He's not just going to take advice from anyone. Um, but even if it's only one thing that you learn from them, if you like it, add it to your repertoire somehow, then trial and error it with your own system and then go from there. And if it doesn't work for you, get rid of it and if it does just keep it rolling so he was a huge advocate of learning from mentors and then obviously so it's twofold he learns from mentors and then he imparts that knowledge as he did in his outlier episode and he does with his book and his talking uh, his speaking etc and then from that creates a legacy that then gets passed on so even though there's four, only four on a team he's in he's had many team members over his six um world championships and everything else that he's won and ultimately what they've done is formed a legacy of like if you think about new zealand adventure races they're deemed as the top of their game right world class best in their field um and he's been through that process from the start but he's also brought on others to be part of that too that not only learn from the best but then they impart that knowledge and send it down the, down the pipe to, to the others coming through so a yes. massive thing there is just learn from people at the top of your game of their game 
and just take one thing that you like from it or one or two things and then just add it to your repertoire as well. Yeah, and I guess all the people that also do the spring challenge and the summer challenge, I mean, there's thousands of, of women that have done these races and I'm sure they must have heard who is Nathan, who is his team, and they've all been inspired by his story. Yeah, like what I love, again, Nathan's a, a very wise man and he's so wise because he's been there, done that. You know, he's, he's just imparting the knowledge that he's learned uh, throughout his journey. And he's a great communicator and a great educator. So it's just such a powerful tool that he's able to impart that knowledge on so many others. And, you know, the Spring Challenge, I think he mentioned 650 teams um, joined. So that's two and a half thousand females who are getting to learn from his wisdom and, and all the trial and error and everything he's been through. And then they get to test it for themselves in the race that he puts on. So very powerful. And how that affects their families as well, because it's not just the individuals, it's not, it's not just a team and the individuals in a team. It's all the families and the friends and the supporters. I mean, it, it really ricochets. Oh, um, yeah, to... the, the, the butterfly effect of that is profound. The, the, the ripples, the impact is significant. So even though it looks like him and his team are being successful, what's being imparted onwards is just profound. Yeah, amazing. And so what, what would you say is your final learning from, from Nathan's episode? Yeah, well, I think, you know, Nathan sums it up. We talk about the analogy of the map and knowing where you are, where you want to go. So I think the key is first, you've got to have your goal. So choose your goal, big, hairy, audacious goal that you are passionate about and that feels compelling to you. Um, and then work out all the steps that you need to perform to make that goal a reality. And then as Nathan does, ask yourself at, at night or in the morning, what did I do today that moved me closer to that goal? And it could be a podcast, it could be a coaching session, it could be a great training session or listening to a, a webinar or something. But as long as you know where you're heading and you're taking action every day, you would think you should get there at some point. So that's a huge one. And he talks about it. It's like the map. Have the goal, know where you're heading, but evaluate as you go, make minor adjustments, stick to the plan, don't let the emotion uh, decrease the intelligence and you'll get to your goal. So that's pretty mm -hmm. simple advice, right? But it's very powerful yeah. advice. And I guess also get, get, some, get some good team players with, on, on board with you as well. Well, exactly. Make sure every one of your teammates is in alignment with the goal and with the vision and they're just as passionate about it as you and then they bring their own talents to, to the team and, and everyone plays their part. Amazing. I've really enjoyed, like I said, I've really enjoyed Nathan's story and I've really enjoyed the, the key takeaways and, and just how like this sport, the sport world also translates into the business world and, and vice versa and I'm very excited for our audience to to get more out of uh, this episode. Um, yeah. And so that's it. So we've, we've kind of wrapped up our key takeaways. And so, so we are so excited that you guys can become your own outlier. We have a really world famous uh, program that you can unleash your own, uh, in, own inner outlier. Is that hard for me to say that? So unleash your inner outlier program. You can go to their website. The link is going to be below. And if you apply to be on our do-it-yourself course, we are throwing in a free strategy call or set or session actually. We're actually a free full session, right, Andrew? It's yeah, a free we'll full give session. Give a full session uh, in addition to the lifetime access to the program. Yeah, amazing. So you get lifetime access to the program and a, a session with Andrew, which is valued at four nine five. So you can really unleash your inner outlier because, you know, we we talk about all of all of these key points that our outliers have done, but we know that to become an outlier ourselves, we've got things that we need to work through. We have some limiting beliefs that we might have to get through to get to to get to be the outlier. So we're really working with people to to unleash them, right? Yeah, okay, like, hey, it's pretty, like I'm pretty uh, confident in, in our ability to help anyone achieve anything, right? And the only reason they wouldn't achieve it is they're not clear on what it looks like with absolute clarity. And that's a real quick process to help them get that clarity. And then they have limits and conflicting thoughts, feelings, beliefs that are going on that are actually sabotaging their success. So we have a process that we help them uproot those as quick as we can 
it's essentially the, the analogy I use there is we set the target of where we want to head. It's like a hot air balloon wanting to take off. And the, the limiting thoughts, feelings, and beliefs are like ropes holding it down. So we cut them out all individually. And all of a sudden, the, the vision is, uh, you know, the balloon is flying and, and it's on its way to its vision with a lot less effort. So I pretty much guarantee if you can't achieve what you want with our support, we'll happily give you money back. No, I have absolute no qualms in doing that. With a proviso that you commit 100% to taking the, the action required to make it happen. Um, yeah, I'm just 100% certain in my ability and our ability to, uh, to help people with that. So if you feel compelled to achieve a big, hairy, audacious goal and you, you know, you want to, or you want to remove some limiting thoughts, feelings, and beliefs that are holding you back from achieving some things, maybe you're attracting certain scenarios that you're wondering, how do I keep attracting this? Then um, definitely join the program. You can, you get access for life and uh, yeah, we'll have a session as well and, and get you on the, on the road. Amazing. Okay, thank you for your time today, Andrew. And thank you for our viewers. Uh, please, if you got something out of it, we would love to hear from you and we'd love to have a comment, uh, a like and share to anybody that you also feel that might get something really valuable from what we had to say. So until next time. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Kay. And again, guys, we talked a lot today too. If you click here, just go and watch the episodes. I'll put both the links above here again. Nathan says it a lot better than we do. It's fantastic. I honestly don't want you to miss it. That's so true. Thank you. Yes, please go and watch the episodes. They're very, very, very insightful. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.